Well, today is the fourth and final sermon in this series with a very silly, tongue-in-cheek, sarcastic title. Being a Christian is easy. You're probably just doing it wrong. And in order to get my point across the last four weeks, I invented the perfect Christian family that I call the Albrights. The Albrights use uh, social media to project this image, this illusion that their life is perfect. That they have no failures, no worries, no disappointments. The Albrights feel that they have to hide their brokenness, their struggles from the rest of us. But my hope is that all of us understand that this is a place where we can come and be real, where we can share our lives and we can trust that we will be accepted, not judged, that we can find support and love in this place. So I want to review the four questions that I've been talking about throughout this sermon series. The first week I said, do you have the perfect life with no problems? Obviously, the answer is no. Our lives are not perfect. They're messy. They're beautiful. Our lives are full of worries, but also wonder and joy. No one's life is perfect, but we're not pretending our lives are perfect, are we? This is a place where we can be authentic. The second question was, do you completely understand all the doctrines of the Christian faith? My guess is I can assume most of you, if not all of you, would say no. Most of us have questions and doubts and things we're still trying to figure out. And not only is that okay, but I think it's actually ideal that if we want to grow in our faith, if we want to have a deeper understanding, we have to ask questions and we have to study and think and use the mind God gave us. The third question, do you give generously without ever sacrificing what you want? Again, most of us would have to say no. Because by definition, sacrificial giving means you sacrifice something you want in order to give and help someone in need and someone who doesn't have what you have. Most of us, I believe, struggle with giving sacrificially. I know I do. And giving sacrificially is really an act of faith. And so it's something we're always growing in. We're growing in our faith, growing in our commitment and our trust that God will provide what we need. And so therefore, we can give generously. So it, it's a process. It's a journey. The fourth question, the one we're looking at today, do you find it easy to forgive people who have hurt you deeply? My guess is if I asked each one of you, you'd probably say no. I know I struggle to forgive when someone has really hurt me deeply. Now, not the little things, right? It's easy to forgive a petty inconvenience, a misunderstanding. You can work those things out. It's easy to forgive that. But sometimes people are cruel Right? They're intentionally mean, and that is hard to shake off. That is hard to forgive. They don't deserve to be forgiven. They deserve to be punished when they do that. Especially, I find that when someone hurts someone that I love, it's hard for me to forgive. There's something instinctual about protecting the people I care about, and I have a hard time letting that go. And really, that's why there's so many Hollywood movies about fighting for your family and getting revenge. Uh, there's a lot of blockbusters, very popular movies, and one of them is this, the movie Taken, with Liam Neeson. Have any of you seen this movie? Yeah? You can raise your hand. Let me see. Okay. Yeah, th this one was so popular, they made two more, right? I have not watched Taken 2 or 3, because I can't get my head around the idea that they just keep kidnapping his family, but uh, <laughs> I just, it doesn't make any sense to me. But the first one is very good. In the first one, Liam Neeson's daughter is actually kidnapped by some sex traffickers in Paris. It's very serious, very very frightening uh, you know, storyline. And he spends the rest of the movie tracking down his daughter, tracking down these bad guys, and making them pay for what they did, right? And it just feels so good. It's so cathartic to see him catch the bad guys and make them pay. And that's why these revenge fantasy movies make so much money. There's something about it very visceral, and we, we can appreciate it and enjoy it. But revenge fantasies make great movies, but this is not a great way to live your life, is it? Especially as a follower of Jesus Christ. This is not how we're called to live. And so Jesus actually very clearly taught, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. He goes on to say, do not judge, and you, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Honestly, that's easier said than done. Right? It's not easy to forgive when someone deeply hurts us. I can tell you there have been times in my life when 
I really struggled to forgive. I couldn't just do it easily. And there was no way I was going to say, well, I'm a Christian, so I just have to forgive you. Because it wouldn't be true, right? It wouldn't be where my heart really was. And so I'm not going to lie and say I forgive you when I don't. But I also know it's, it's not healthy to just ignore those feelings, to deny and bury uh, the resentment and the bitterness. Because resentment is poison, right? And bitterness is toxic. When I'm stuck, when I'm struggling to forgive and I'm seething with anger, I really have to go to God in prayer. I have to. I can't save myself. I can't resolve the problem. I can't find um, closure without God's help. And so in my experience, it just takes time and, and trusting God and praying and trying to surrender that resentment and that bitterness because I'm struggling with letting it go. But I know in, in my experience that it's just exhausting right, to dwell on it and hold on to it and not let it go. And that point leads me to another genre of movies that is not as popular as revenge fantasies. It's the genre of historic drama. And usually historic dramas involve uh, suffering and loss, and then there's redemption and forgiveness at the end of the movie. And generally those movies are made on small budgets and nobody goes to see them. One of them is Philomena, this movie that was made in 2013. Very powerful movie. It was nominated for four Oscars, but no, hardly anybody went to see it. But it's a true story. It's about this woman, Philomena, um, played by Judy Dench. And she's an Irish woman, and she finds this um, journalist, Martin, and they, they work together to track down her son who was adopted when he was three years old, who was adopted away from her. She had grown up in Ireland and Philomena had gotten pregnant as a teenager and in that time in Ireland what they did was they would send a pregnant girl to live with the, the nuns in the convent. And it was not a, a happy experience, it was a very negative experience for her. Uh, she labored washing clothes as what she understood as punishment for her sin of having sex. Now the nuns took her son Anthony away from her when he was three years old and let a couple from America adopt him and she never saw him again. There's a powerful scene near the end of the movie that we're about to watch where Philomena and the reporter Martin have figured out that the nuns have been lying to them about Anthony, the son. And so now they're going to confront uh, the nuns. And Philomena discovers that her son, when he was grown up, actually came back to Ireland, came back to the convent to try to find out who his mom was, and the nuns wouldn't tell him. He died from AIDS. And his mother, uh, in the scene we're about to see, is uh, confronting the nuns that lied to her. What she finds out is that he died and he's actually buried on the grounds at the convent. And so you can, you can imagine all that built up anger and resentment. And Martin uh, confronts the nun here and we'll see how this plays out. I didn't want to bring him in here like this to make a scene. Why are you apologizing? Anthony was dying of AIDS and she still wouldn't tell him about you. But it happened to me, not you. It's up to me what I do about it. It's my choice. So what, you're just going to do nothing? No. Sister Hildegard. I want you to know that I forgive you. But just like that? Just like that, that's hard. That's hard for me. But I don't want to hate people. I don't want to be like you. <sighs> Look at you. I'm angry. Well, must be exhausting. Sister Claire, I wonder would you be so kind as to take me to my son's grave? There's two different responses there to a very horrible thing, a, a very serious betrayal and wound. Philomena forgives, 
and Martin is still angry. And I have to tell you, after watching the movie and hearing Filomino's story, I'm with Martin. I, I was very angry at that scene, and I was like, yeah, you tell him. It was much easier for me to relate to his response than to hers. And I know that about myself, and that's why I need to hear the word of God calling me to the better angels of my nature. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Amen.